Okay, um, so before that, though, I wanted to introduce Sarah Peterson, who is uh, with the Atlanta Science Festival to say a few words. Thanks, Lisa. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Peterson. I'm one of the co-founders of Science ATL, the organization that produces the Atlanta Science Festival. Um, we're thrilled to be partnering um, and collaborating with Horizon again. Um, we have a couple of instances of the show, so we're super excited. We've had it throughout the two weeks of the festival. Um, if you want to learn more about the Science Festival, um, we have lots of information at atlantasciencefestival.org. There's a couple of things left um, and then a couple of things that will be ongoing. Um, but we wanted to just say thank you again. Science ATL is interested in bringing people together through the wonder of science. And we see that there are opportunities to build community around science um, in all kinds of places. So we're super excited um, that Horizon wanted to join us um, in this journey. Um, so thanks so much for being here and enjoy the show. Great. Uh, well, we, uh, like I said, we originally, thank you, Sarah. We uh, hopefully will check out some other things in the Atlanta Science Festival. I know we have an artistic associate, Nicole Palmietto, uh, who's doing a virtual play that's kind of a virtual theater slash uh, escape room that is happening this weekend. It's called The Shift. You can find that on the Atlanta Science Festival website. I know people went last weekend. I'm going on Friday. Uh, it should be really a lot of fun. And it's a science-based escape game kind of thing. So looking forward to seeing that. Uh, but the scene that we're seeing tonight is by Edamar Moses, and uh, it is uh, uh, when we did it in the fall, I thought, oh my gosh, what a perfect fit for the Atlanta Science Festival, uh, because I love plays that, personally love plays that weave science and personal stories together. And this play was commissioned by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the mission of that foundation is to have leading playwrights explore uh, writing plays about science themes and about featuring scientists and leading characters. So in this play, we meet two PhD students. Uh, one is Molly, a molecular biologist, and Elliot, a computer scientist. Uh, and Elliot, they meet in the computer lab, and he woos her with science and with logarithms and stuff like that. Um, the play is by Edomar Moses, who's a Tony Award winning playwright. He wrote the Broadway musical, The Band's Visit. And we were honored to actually have him down here a few years ago. We did another play of his called Nobody Loves You, which is actually a play about uh, a musical about uh, an on a dating game, a television uh, dating show, sort of like The Bachelor, except different. Um, so we did that with him. And now we have this totally different kind of show. Uh, so um, that's what it is. And now I'm going to introduce our special guest uh, because uh, she is the perfect person for this because uh, she is a young PhD student, which is exactly what's in the play. Uh, and she can, uh, and she's got part of the science that she's working on. She can tell you about this is Sarah Blumenbaum. This is her second year in neuroscience as a PhD student at Emory University, working in the lab with Dr. Larry Young. And her research focuses on the neurobiological mechanisms underlying empathy like behavior and social bonding. She got her master's degree in experimental psychology at William and Mary, and her bachelor's in psychology and journalism. German from Wake Forest. And so we welcome Sarah here today to be with us. Uh, so Sarah, are you, up, are you up on the screen? I'm trying to, I'm reading my notes here. Okay, yeah. uh, yay. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Just uh, We're going to talk with you more afterwards, but just keep people an overview of what you're doing there at Larry's lab. I was very fortunate to have three different people talk to me from the lab. So I have the big overview, but you can give us the big overview. Yeah, so um, our lab kind of focuses on bonding and how that works. So what is the neural underpinnings of bonding? And when we think about bonding, that's sort of the basis for all of our relationships, whether they're social relationships or love relationships. And so we take this thing bonding and we really take it apart and study it at the neural mechanisms to try to understand it, to help us understand how we as humans form relationships. Um, and my work is on empathy in particular. So um, what is going on in our brain that lets us feel for other people and want to help others. Um, so I'm really interested in that question. Um, and we study all of this in uh, monogamous prairie voles, which are these cute little chunky rodents. Um, and they are monogamous. So males and females form bonds for life. And they're a great model for us to study this in. So it's been really exciting to get to work with Larry and to learn a lot from him. 
It's really cool. And I think I love that there are people working on all different things related on social bonding in the lab. So we'll hear a little bit more about that later and uh, they'll get to hear all about what you're doing and what being a PhD is. I learned a lot about what being a PhD in science was by talking to you. So I'm hoping that when we record this, I'll get some people who are looking at that as a career path to be able to watch this and understand more about that. Okay, so we're back. Here we are. Welcome to Sarah. So happy to have you. Thank you um, so much for having me. Great. So Sarah is um, a scientist and a second year PhD student at Emory studying um, the neurobiological mechanisms underlying empathy and social bonding. So uh, you're a science uh, PhD student and you're watching this play about science PhD students. Tell me like what resonated with you? What did you go? Oh, wow, that's totally truthful. Or boy, they really got the science wrong there. I just don't know. <laughs> um, I guess I would say um, a lot of the uh, stress that comes along with being a, a PhD student was accurate. Um, I would say there's a not too many late nights, but you know there is a lot of stress involved, um, and just being really passionate about your science, I think, is also a big part of it. Um, some things they got wrong. I don't think that uh, <laughs> I don't think that um, advisee advisor relationships are as common as uh, one might think. Uh, I certainly haven't heard of any. Um, but you do end up having a very close relationship with your advisor, more like a friendship than a, um, than a, you know, more like a relationship relationship. So that was something I was watching. I was like, oh, okay, that's <laughs> a bit elaborated. Um, but, you know, I thought they got the essence of grad school, right? Yeah. What about um, the idea of scientists working together like that? They get the sort of feeling of that, of people collaborating. and Definitely. I think that what, that's one of the most important things in science is collaborating and working together. I think um, when people think of scientists, they think of, you know, like really nerdy people in lab coats who are not very social and don't want to interact with other people. Um, and while not everyone in science is an extro extrovert, I won't say that, um, collaboration is really key because you don't know it all and it's really important to get ideas from other people. So um, it's highly encouraged to work with other labs um, and across departments and there's lots of cool collaborations always going on and it's just exciting to get to you know, have new ideas and perspectives coming into your science. Yeah, it's always so interesting because the arts and sciences are similar that way. They both take a tremendous amount of collaboration and creativity. I mean, it's just different kinds of creativity, right? The brain just going in different directions, but it's uh, very similar in terms of, I think that's why I love science so much because it's it's a similar thing, just a different kind of passion, what you're interested yeah. in. So um, what about, oh, tell me a little bit about your lab overall. What do you do in the lab? What's, what's, I know the lab is a bunch of people, not just you and um, you're a professor, which they call the PI, is that correct? Yeah, no, that stands no, no, for principal investigator. Yeah. Um, um, so Larry Young is the guy and I know everyone looks up to Larry and, uh, but tell us about the lab. Um, so our lab is pretty big. Um, so we have a lot of grad students. We have, well, not a lot. We have three grad students, um, but we have a lot of what are called postdocs. So these are people who've already done their PhD and are getting more training before they go on to start their own lab. So um, we have like six or seven postdocs and um, several people who are just working in the lab full time. That's their whole career is to work in this lab. Um, and what's so great about the lab is that everyone has um, sort of their own niche um, and we have different wings of the lab. So some people are um, doing stuff really just with like cells and really nitty gritty. Some people are more behaviorally focused. So just working with the animals. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in between. And the great thing about working with Larry is he sort of just cultivates people from all these really cool, interesting backgrounds to come work in the lab. Um, so there's lots of great ideas flowing. Um, and our lab has people from all over the world in it. We have people from Japan, China, the Netherlands, just all over the place. So um, it's, a, it's a really neat place to work. That's so cool. For people that were not with us or tuned in beforehand, well, tell me what the overview, what's the overarching research? What's, uh, what's the lab's goal overall? Yeah, so my advisor's main focus is on pair bonding. Um, so this is when two people, two individuals, a male and a female, two animals, whatever, a pair, um, 
have a close attachment. That can be a social attachment or more of a romantic attachment. Um, so we're really interested in what causes this bond. So what are the neural mechanisms underlying these bonds forming? And we can use this information to better understand either our social relationships or our romantic relationships. Um, and we're really interested in this one hormone called oxytocin, which some people may have heard of. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the love hormone um, because it is involved in a lot of, um, it is what gets released when you are in love with someone. And so um, we study this in animals because animals have this hormone as well. Um, and we can better understand how this hormone acts to influence feelings of love and attachment and bonds. And do you, and usually there's some kind of real life goal in, uh, in research or not always, but are there real life goals of things that you're trying to investigate or improve in the lab? Definitely. So um, we always try to keep in mind the real world problem that we're trying to solve when we get into our work. Um, so we think of our stuff as being related to um, sort of social interactions. And there's a lot of disorder psychiatric conditions where social processing goes awry. So think of things like autism spectrum disorder or social anxiety disorder. These are instances where your social processing isn't happening as it should be. And so we can look at the ways that the brain works in these social interactions and to form relationships and understand how that works to then understand what goes wrong in these psychiatric conditions. Um, so some of Larry's work has been used to um, look at using oxytocin to give people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and it has been shown that if you give oxytocin to people with autism spectrum disorder, they are much improved in their ability to um, express empathy, uh, to form connections, to respond to social cues. Um, so there's a lot of science um, from our lab that's directly being put into human work and hopefully going to the patients um, that can help their lives. Oh. Yeah, when uh, Charlie was talking last week, he said something that was interesting, which is that the oxytocin is not necessarily given as an ongoing drug to them, but as a sort of a... Uh, trying to, he's described as trying to rewire the brain or shock the brain into something, which I thought was really interesting. It's kind of, it can be used as sort of like a breakthrough thing. So think about if um, you have someone who's really aversive to social interactions or has difficulty in social interactions, um, you can bring oxytocin on board and put them in a social interaction and maybe it becomes much more positive for them. So normally a social interaction, they're not picking up on the cues, something goes wrong, they get nervous. Uh, that becomes a really unpleasant situation and you're not likely to wanna go into an interaction again because it's been unpleasant. But if you bring oxytocin on board, that makes that interaction much more pleasurable, you enjoy it. And then maybe next time you're much more likely to want to go into a social interaction and have a positive experience uh, because you had that oxytocin in the one prior. Got it. So to try to retraining the brain, retraining it away from a behavior that is learned over time. And, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and oxytocin will also um, help the brain form different connections that will um, just in general, not just make it more pleasurable, but make it easier to communicate and easier to have social interactions. Um, so. And what, what's your resource? So you've been, you, this is your second year. Well, this is, is this your first year in this lab or is this your second year in the lab? Yeah, I started in the lab in August. Yeah, so you're, to explain, I was really interested in this, that when you went to the PhD program, what's the first thing you do in that you first year PhD? Tell, talk a little bit about that because that was interesting to me. Yeah, so when you start in a PhD program, um, it depends on the program, but at least at Emory, your first year you do rotations. So um, I spent, about three months in three different labs. So three months in each lab, um, trying out different things. So um, I got to sort of experience different lab cultures, try different models, um, study different things. And then at the end of the year, I chose uh, a lab that I felt was the best fit for me, which was Larry's lab. Um, but it was a cool experience. I got to um, you know, work with mice and um, I was looking at social stuff in the mice as well. I uh, got to do some Parkinson's research and some non-human primates um, and I got to study narcolepsy. So I was a little all over the place. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> but I learned a lot. It was a really cool experience. Um, and then I ended up in Larry's lab at the end of it. So it worked out well. And so what did you do? What have you been doing since August then? So you started in um, there. 
Yeah, so my, um, my research is focused on consoling behaviors um, and their relation to empathy. So uh, a consoling behavior is just if I see you're in trouble, um, you're in distress in some way, I go and I try to make you feel better. That's consoling. Um, and the animals that we study, these prairie voles, which are these cute little um, rodents that are monogamous with each other. So there's a male and a female, they form a bond, um, they mate for life, they co-parent, um, they build a nest and they defend it against other prairie voles. Um, so they form this really tight monogamous attachment um, that is really uncommon in rodent species so we can study them. Um, and they do a lot of things with each other, but one of the things that they do is um, they console each other when one of them's in distress. So um, if we put one of the animals in distress, uh, we will see that the other animal goes and grooms the other animal, huddles beside them, licks them. Um, it's just trying to make them feel better. Um, and you don't see that in mice or rats. So this is pretty mm -hmm. unique to the prairie voles, which is why it's really interesting to get to study them. Um, and we found this out just a couple of years ago in our lab. So we're the, it's the first time we're showing this ever um, was a few years ago in the lab. And so I've sort of run with that um, discovery. And now I'm trying to figure out the neural underpinnings of that behavior. Um, so there's a couple of key brain areas that I'm interested in, and I think they're communicating. Um, so I'm going to use some specific genetic techniques um, to manipulate circuits in the brain um, that I think are underlying this consoling behavior and see how it affects the behavior. Um, and so that's sort of what my big project is. And I think it's important to study consoling because it's a key part of empathy, right? Empathy is detecting someone else's emotional state and having an emotional reaction to it. Um, and we can't really ask the voles if they are feeling empathy for their partner, but we can see how they act towards their partner. Um, and that's how we're able to really study this. Um, and consoling behavior is seen across species. We see it in um, in bulls, we see it in monkeys, we see it in humans. Um, and I just think it's really exciting to get to study empathy right now, because I think, with, especially with everything in this past year, we're all learning um, that we could all use a little bit more empathy for each other. Um, and so it's exciting to get to be studying something so, you know, of the times <laughs> right now. I'm, I'm going to come back to your empathy study, but I do want to acknowledge that people have got some questions. So I'm going to go into this and see what we, questions. And if you gave this question and you want to come up to the screen, just, uh, just put it in the chat and we'll bring you forward to say it yourself, but I'll read them. Uh, what do you think the assistant professor system still in place? Why do you think the assistant professor system is still in place in academia when it seems that grad students hate teaching undergrads and undergrads hate not having the real prop for which they have, feel they paid leading their classes? <laughs> So I I guess this student might be referring to teaching assistants. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Assistant professorship is slightly different. Um, but a teaching assistantship. Um, I'm so sorry that you've had teaching assistants who <laughs> didn't seem like they wanted to be teaching you. Um, I do know that that is sometimes the case. Unfortunately, I was also an undergrad and had um teaching assistants who I didn't think were super excited to be there. Um, I will say it really depends on the program. So some programs. Uh, require that graduate students teach in order to receive their pay, um, which, uh, you know, we can debate how that's kind of messed up. Um, at Emory, you're only required to teach for one semester. Uh, so I did that last semester, got it out of the way. Now I don't have to teach again. I might because I actually do enjoy teaching. I don't hate it, <laughs> um, but I, I don't have to in order to get paid, which is a really nice freedom that I have that I can pursue that if I want to. Um, but it is it is a flawed system. I'll agree with you on that. Um, you know, we don't receive a ton of training before we become teaching assistants. And sometimes we haven't taken the class that we're teaching. So um, that can be a bit confusing for everyone involved. Um, but hopefully, uh, I don't know, hopefully your teaching assistants in the future are more excited to work with you. And I don't think that they hate working with undergrads. I wouldn't say that. I think they're just stressed is the bottom line stress and overworked <laughs> is probably the root of that yeah well you, you have a lot of empathy so th that would make you a good teacher right oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see okay approximately what percentage of non-human animals tend to form in monogamous pairs Ooh, i don't know the exact 
percentage um, off the top of my head, but I know that it's um, pretty uncommon. I think it's some, I think, I feel like I've heard the number 9% thrown around. So I'm going to throw that out there, but don't quote me on it. Um, there's some bird species that form monogamous pair bonds. Um, it's actually relatively common in um, the bird kingdom. Hmm. Very uncommon in fish and reptile species. I think there's like one or two for each of those classes. Um, there's a handful of monkeys that are monogamous, but not all monkeys are monogamous. Um, actually, most species are not monogamous in uh, monkeys. Um, and then humans tend to be monogamous. I wouldn't say we as a species are monogamous. It sort of depends on societal culture and norms. Um, so it's not very common in, um, in the wild, which is why it's so interesting to see it in this rodent species. Yeah, and do they you have any hypotheses about why in prairie voles that, that is? Yeah, I don't know about specifically why in periables, but there are arguments for the advantages of monogamy. Um, so, you know, if um, if you decide that this other animal is going to be your partner, then you can invest all of your energy into that one partner and you don't have to worry about other partners and you can invest all of your energy together into your offspring and make sure that your genes are passed and that those offspring are raised really well to then pass on their genes. Um, so it's sort of a, um, where are you allocating your resources? Are you allocating them towards forming this pair bond or are you allocating them to continuously refinding a mate and hoping that their genes are good? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of species that do it the other way because it maybe takes less effort to just mate and then forget about it. Um, but, you know, uh, there is adv advantages to forming this pair bond. Um, for the males in the variable relationship, they get to pass on their genes and know that their offspring will be raised really well. And for the females, they get protection. Um, and for both of them, they get camaraderie. And um, there is a lot of benefits in the brain, um, a lot of pleasure that comes from this pair bond formation. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know. Um, so there may be an evolutionary, uh, there's an evolutionary advantage to monogamy. That exactly. I don't know specifically in the prairie bull though. I think it's yeah. actually- In general good. though. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody says, let's see, Joey says, this reminds me of the eye gazing practice, including bonding for adopted children, et cetera. I don't know what that is, but maybe you could explain what that is. Um, are you referring to if you um, make, eye contact with your baby that you like release oxytocin is that yeah i don't i'm not sure he's this is uh joey you want to do you want to say do you want you want can you uh, let him speak up unmute him or him or her they maybe hi joey hi can you hear me yes i can hear you okay. Sorry. Yeah, it, it take more time to type it in. I meant, um, so I've heard about practices and I don't know if oxytocin is specifically involved in this. I, I'm assuming it is. And I was wondering if you've done any studies or read anything about, there's a, a certain practice and I don't know the formal name of it for like adoptive parents or parents with children. I think, I think maybe about 10 years ago it was uh, parents of um, extremely autistic children, I'm not sure, doing this practice of extended, prolonged, you know, eye gazing, um, mm. which was supposed to promote bonding. It was very uncomfortable at first, but then it, as you practice it, supposedly it becomes, you know, easier. Anyway, I, I was just curious to see if that had come up in any of your research or any of Definitely. It. I think that um, eye gaze is something that always comes up when you're talking about autism, because um, in autism spectrum disorders, there is an aversion to um, eye contact, which I think um, is like one of the most obvious things that people talk about. Um, and you start to see this very early on. So you start to see this aversion in um, making eye contact when the baby is like two or three months old. So very, very early on, you can tell. Um, and this is partially because we think because the the eye contact in babies with autism or just people with autism isn't inherently rewarding. Whereas in humans, it is, or not in humans, gosh, I'm sorry. In, um, 
in uh, typically developed- neurotypical, neurotypical. <laughs> Sorry, in neurotypical. I'm so used to talking about humans versus animals. Right. And, I got <laughs> it. And, um, in You're in the human world now. Yeah. <laughs> in neurotypical people, um, making eye contact is not necessarily aversive, although it can be in certain situations, right? No one likes staring at someone. No one likes making too much eye contact. But when you're in a conversation with someone, you are focusing on their eyes and you're gaining a lot of information from that, right? Like, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul, all that stuff. There's truth in that. We use eye gaze in order to assess another individual's emotional state, what they're thinking and feeling. So it's really important to us. But children with autism don't get that same information from making eye contact. And so they don't pay attention to the eyes as much. In fact, they tend to pay attention to the mouth because mm. the mouth is speaking and that's where they're getting their information from. Also, you sort of touched on this um, bond forming from eye contact. Um, that is true. So um, oxytocin really is most known for being released when mothers give birth and from helping with breastfeeding. Um, and it's also really important for helping the mother form a bond with her baby. And part of this is through eye contact between the mother and the child. So when the mother makes eye contact with the baby, oxytocin gets released in the mother's brain and in the baby's brain. Um, when you make eye contact with your partner, oxytocin gets released. When you make eye contact with your dog, oxytocin gets released in both you and your dog so it's just this bonding Yay, dogs <laughs> exactly it's just this bonding hormone and a lot of times eye contact is the way that we're you know we're connecting with another human i wonder if they will ever have or maybe they do oxyto oxytocin pills or such a thing is that like something that people are exploring about mood alteration in a way that you know they have done with other kinds of drugs dopamine and stuff yeah, so oxytocin is unfortunately a tricky drug to work with. So um, oxytocin uh, is difficult to get into the brain because it's really big um, compared to things that can get into the brain. So our brain is covered with this um, sort of layer of barriers. It's called the blood brain barrier and it prevents things from getting into the brain that shouldn't be there. This is why our brain isn't constantly getting infections, um, which, you know, that would be a big problem. Yeah. And so anything that can get into the brain um, is what's called psychoactive. So you maybe have heard of like psychoactive drugs. Right. So any drugs that have an effect on your brain are small enough that they can pass into the blood brain barrier to get in there. Oxytocin, unfortunately, is really big. And so it's really difficult to administer it to people. Um, they've tried doing a nasal spray because it's easier to get bigger things into the brain through the mm. nose. Um, and the nasal spray does work, but it doesn't work really well. So right now, what people are trying to do is figure out ways to indirectly cause oxytocin release in the brain. So instead of just giving people more oxytocin, you can stimulate the areas in the brain that cause oxytocin to be released, and then you get more oxytocin. Um, so there's a drug called melanotan, um, and it, it acts on oxytocin um, neurons and causes them to release oxytocin. Um, and so it's been looked at as a potential treatment for social deficits. Um, it's also been known to uh, promote weight loss and make you tan. So it's called the Barbie drug. Um, so a make lot you of tan, really? It, it causes your, um, like it works on uh, your melanin receptors in your oh, skin. Wow, um, so it makes you, you darker, yeah. Um, so the, our lab is actually studying it. Charlie, who spoke um, the other week is actually studying it in his research. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are looking at it. I don't know if it's um, like something you can buy. Um, like over What's it called again? What's the, it's called melanotan. Melanotan. It's, it's technically melanotan too, if anyone wants to Google it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so um, that's sort of our best avenue right now, but people are working on other ways to get oxytocin into the brain. So it's an ongoing effort. Well, I want to jump back to your that your research now because you got got into you starting to talk about how you were do, going to do um, uh, gene replacement, right? So explain exactly how that works because that that was fascinating to me. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of of different sort of genetic techniques that I'm going to be using. Um, the first is I'm interested in. Um, sort of all the pathways that are involved in this empathy response. And I'm going to be looking at one specific area, um, and I want to see all the, the things that input to that area. Um, so 
I, what I do is I modify the, um, so sorry, let me back up. I'm interested in all of the inputs to say um, cells in this particular area that express oxytocin receptors, okay? So what I can do is I can put in a virus into the animal's brain in this particular area that causes all of the cells with oxytocin receptors on them to fluoresce. So we put um, in a fluorescent protein, it's called green fluorescent protein. We get it from jellyfish. Um, so jellyfish that in the ocean, they auto fluoresce. We take some of that from them and we put it into a virus and we put it in an animal's brain and those cells will light up green. Um, and so we can sort of look at those cells um, and we can manipulate the virus. So instead of just looking at those cells, we look at all of their processes or we look at all of their inputs. Um, and we can get a lot of information this way. So this is sort of how um, we do tracing and circuit mapping in the brain um, using these techniques. Um, and then another set of experiments that I'm going to be doing is to modify the animal's behavior. So I wanna turn off either certain cells in certain areas or certain pathways. And I can do this um, using a virus again. Um, and in this virus, I will tell it to make a special type of receptor in um, the cells that I'm interested in. So um, say oxytocin receptor cells in this particular brain area, I will tell them to make this extra protein um, that they've never made before. It doesn't exist in the brain. And this protein is a receptor. So it gets put on the cell surface. And this is a little receptor. Um, and it doesn't do anything. Nothing in the brain reacts with it. It doesn't bind to anything in the brain. It does nothing, except I have a drug in the lab that acts on this, um, on this one receptor. So nothing in the brain is ever going to act on it until I put this drug in the animal. So I can have the animal do the behavior. It acts normally. And then I give it an injection of this drug. And this drug goes into that brain area, gloms on to the receptor, and it either can turn on or off the cell. So I can, with just a simple injection, turn on or off a whole set of the brain, a whole brain area, a whole pathway, a whole network, whatever I decide. And so it's really exciting and I can see exactly what is happening to the behavior when I turn off these specific cells or this pathway or whatever. And that can tell me that that pathway is important for this behavior. Um, and then I can take the drug away and see that the behavior returns. And then I really know so it's an ability to have an on-off switch in the brain um, in a very, very like controlled technical way. Um, and this is all stuff that has come about in the last like decade or so um, in neuroscience. And it's really exciting to get to be able to use these genetic techniques to learn more about the brain. Wow, that's really amazing. And how do you actually, what, what do you actually use to look at it? Like what's the, what's the, what do you do it? Are you you have something hooked up that goes in the computer or what do you, what do you, is it out of the microscope? I mean, how, do, what's the physical manifestation of how you do it? So it sort of depends on, um, on what you're, what technique you're using. So for my particular techniques, um, I will, you know, just look at the behavioral output. And then um, afterwards, I'll take the animal's brain and I'll cut it up into really, really thin sections. And I'll look at it under a microscope um, that detects fluorescence. And because, oh, I guess I didn't say this, but when I create that receptor, that special receptor that's only activated by that special drug, um, I also will attach a fluorescent protein to it. So it'll fluoresce. So I can just put it under a microscope and it'll be bright red or bright green or bright blue. You can choose any color. There's a whole spectrum. Um, you can have three colors going at once if you want to have different colors doing different things. Um, and then I'll take images of it and it'll let me know, OK, this fluorescence is all in this one area. Um, and that is the area I was interested in. So I know that it worked in that area. Right. Or if I'm doing tracing, I can say I want all of the inputs to this area to be green. And then I look at it under a microscope and I can see all of the cells. They'll be they will actually be green and you can see the whole structure, the body of it. All the processes will be bright green um, and you can just take pictures of it. And uh, and how. Who, where do the viruses come from? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so you can buy them online. 
um, as you can most things. Um, so there's a special website that we buy a lot of our viruses from. Um, but we are also very lucky in our lab to have um, someone who creates them himself. Um, and I personally don't know anything about how he does it. He's a genius. Um, but I imagine it's a lot of um, it's a lot of minute manipulations and um, little cutting here, you know, adding something in here. Um, maybe something that some of you have heard of, uh, if any of you have heard of CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, it's a genome editing system. We use that to make viruses. So you can um, take maybe um, a virus and you can input certain genetic code that you want. Um, he is like Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. You can input certain genetic code that you want um, to code for these proteins that we want to create or to code to destroy certain proteins in the brain. Yes, CRISPR, exactly. Um, so it can be used for a lot of things. Um, it's not just used for making designer babies. It can also be used for making designer prairie bulls. So <laughs> utility. That's really amazing. Um, let's see, uh, other things. Um, so there are some things in the play to refer back to. Uh, they, you know, they have these Kind of eureka moments in the play have you had eureka moments like that where you went oh that's it um maybe not so much in my data yet because i haven't um i don't have a lot to show for this year yeah. i've been working on getting it all set up um but i was um i did have a eureka moment last semester i was writing a grant um for a class and um trying to sort of figure out like what was my story missing in terms of like all my all my studies, um, how I wanted them to fit together? There's just a piece missing, um, and I was sitting on my bed in my apartment, and it actually just like came to me. It was truly a eureka moment. I was like, oh, I know the series of experiments. I have to run, and it'll all fit together. And I got in my car and I drove back to campus because I wanted to tell my advisor I was so excited and I like came barreling into his office and I was like ah this is what I want to do and he was just like yeah yeah that sounds good <laughs> so <laughs> and, and so was it um like he says in the play was did that come to you or while you were doing something else he said you some of the best ideas come when you go off doing something else when you had eureka moment you remember no, I think I was unfortunately working on the grant. You were thinking about it. <laughs> but you know, it, it was like very much like all the pieces clicked at once, um, which was a very gratifying moment. Um, talk a little bit about the, 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 another thing that's in the play is about um, whether this department that they're in is collaborative enough across departments. Yeah, talk a little about the other people that are in your department. I know there is a lot of cross disciplinary collaboration, what other kinds of people are working in your department? Yes. Scientists. So Emory, um, Emory's neuroscience program, there's no actual neuroscience department at Emory, um, mm -hmm. but the neuroscience program has over 100 faculty members in it. And you have people from all over the place. Like you have people from psychology, biology, physics. Um, my advisor's in psychiatry. We have people at the med school. Um, we have people at the VA hospital, you know, all over the place. Um, and it's highly encouraged to get involved and collaborate. Um, our lab collaborates with people, not just at Emory, but all over the world um, in multiple different disciplines. Um, so like I said earlier, there's a lot of like benefit to getting those ideas in there. Um, and, you know, I think, depending on where you are at, like depending on the school, maybe collaboration isn't as highlighted as it is at Emory. I think one of the reasons I chose Emory was because collaboration is so um, coveted there um, and I wanted to be at a place like that. Um, but, you know, it doesn't benefit anyone not to collaborate. It's, it's really a detriment to yourself if you're not collaborating. Um, but I do think some scientists get a little bit, um, protective of their work and scared that people are going to steal it because that does happen in science. It, there's a term for it, it's called scooping. Um, you scoop someone else's ideas, you scoop their data. So you hear someone give a talk and then you go quickly run those experiments yourself and get the paper out before them. Um, so that does happen. There's a, a sneaky side to science, unfortunately. Um, but I think that that happens less and less nowadays um, and is obviously highly looked down upon. Um, so I think maybe that's where her advisor was coming from. I'm not wanting to collaborate, not wanting to share his ideas, didn't want to get them stolen. Um, but I just think it it doesn't benefit anyone if you do it that way. 
and there's there's a computer scientist in this play running logarithms. I know that is the case in your lab too. You want to talk a little bit about the role of computers in the lab and how that's working with um, with the brain science. Yeah, so um, computer science is really important for neuroscience. There's actually a whole sect of neuroscience called computational neuroscience um, that, you know, is incredible and, and very helpful um, for neuroscience as a whole. So, you know, we can run models of mice and rats and you know, voles all day, and we do, and it's really important to do that, but a computer can do it really, really quickly. And so if we give a computer a set of behavioral data from an animal or a set of, you know, um, you know, cellular data from an animal uh, or a series of animals, and we say, find patterns, what do those patterns tell us? Then it can sort of extrapolate that to bigger and bigger problems, and it can start sort of running itself on its own. Um, and so one of the ways that we do this in our lab, um, we have a student named Senna, and um, he takes uh, videos of the animals interacting. So, you know, a male and a female um, interacting, huddling with each other, all those kinds of things. Um, and he is showing the computer where they're moving and telling the computer, this is this type of behavior, this is that type of behavior. Now you know computer, go on your own and see if you can figure it out. And so he feeds the computer lots and lots of um, behavioral data and lets the computer sort of determine what the animals are doing at any moment in time. Um, and he's working on sort of optimizing that, um, but we can use those tools very effectively in the lab. So if we, instead of having me take hours and hours and hours of my life coding and scoring videos of animals interacting, which is incredibly boring, um, I will say, uh, just watching them interact and having to say like, yep, they're huddling now, now they're sniffing each other, now they're doing this, I can give it to Senna, he can put it through a computer program, and it can tell me, this is all the behaviors they did, this is how long they did them, and then I can immediately put that in a data set. Um, so that's just one way that we're using computer science in our lab, um, and it's, it's going to be, I mean, once all of that really gets off the ground, it's going to revolutionize the way that we do um, behavioral neuroscience because it's just going to save us so much time. Yeah, he's still right. He's still figuring it out. He, uh, Senna is, we did a topic with Senna last week and it's going to be up on YouTube and Vimeo channels. Um, next, Amy's going to put it up. But it's so interesting because he was talking about, talking about making behavior into math which I mean, I don't understand that at all, but, yeah. but tell him how he makes behavior into math with that feeds in the computer, which then appears on the computer screen as colors and shapes and different things that represent behavior, which is just un incredible. Um, but he said, I, but I really haven't perfected it yet. This is my, yeah. this is what my PhD is about. So yeah. I'm trying to work it so that we have it, but I am making it right now. So yeah. that's cool. It's his, his stuff is, very complicated because there's a lot of technology on how to do this with one animal but having interactions between animals adds a whole other layer of complexity um but there's also a lot of people who are working on um we just heard a talk about this last week so it's fresh on my mind um of being able to predict behavior based on how animals are acting so if an animal does a sniff and a turn then it's highly likely it's going to do this next and the computer can find those patterns and tell us that that these behaviors seem to happen in a sequence or together always. Um, and so that can be really helpful for us understanding what's going on. Because um, really we're just watching, watching them interact and trying to understand. And so sometimes a computer can pick up on those nuances better than we can. Yeah, Asana said, you know, you can't possibly see, the, the computer can map it to such minutia that the human eye can't even pick up that level of minutia that the computer can map it to, which is cool. Yeah. A couple, uh, no, somebody says almost like CGI mapping, which is true. And then somebody says, um, uh, any cro cool cross-discipline connections that you've seen happen that are mm -hmm. you, that jump out to you? I know we have a lot of people in our building um, we also have a primate research center in our building. Um, and a lot of those people do a lot of collaborations with anthropology, um, which I think is pretty neat, um, sort of connecting human civilization to the way that um, these primates are interacting. Um, I think that's a really cool connection. Um, I'm trying to think of other neat connections, like collaborations with departments that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, I don't know in terms of like, I think 
there, it tends to be pretty much what you would expect, right? Like a collaboration yeah. with chemistry or physics or things like that. Um, but sometimes we pair together with um, different departments to give talks. So, um, you know, like, like this, for instance, is a, a bit of a, a cross collaboration, right? Um, I'm not in theater, um, but I am working with a theater right now. And so that's a, an exciting opportunity. Um, so sometimes we'll have talks with, um, you know, my, my advisor did a talk last year with like a relationship expert, like a, a like actual therapist, relationship yeah. therapist. Um, and so he's talking about the science of it. And she's talking about the real life interactions and her clients and things like that so um i don't know if that fully answers your question but um that's what i can think of off the top of my head so um always cool connections being made like that cool um there's a, something that says the one thing that said in the play is we um we the longer we do this we fall into certain patterns of our behave of behavior um is that something you find to be true not with you you wouldn't be far enough along but when you is that one reason that professors bring in all these young grad students is to shake them up a little bit or keep them keep definitely them that is i mean i think that i think a lot of times when people like from the outside think about grad student relationships with their advisors they think like oh, the advisor is pouring all this knowledge into the grad student and the grad student is just soaking it up and like becoming like a mini advisor and then just being shot out into the world. And that's absolutely not the case at all. Um, I do feel like I'm learning a lot and gaining a lot from my advisor, but I also think that I'm bringing a lot of ideas to the table um, and like new techniques, um, new avenues of interest, new ways of doing things um, that's always happening. And so I think there's always a, um, that kind of relationship between the advisor and the advisee. Um, and especially with postdocs, um, which is what you do after your PhD, they specifically want to hire people to be postdocs who have a technique that the lab has never seen before. Mm -hmm. So they want people to bring in new techniques into the lab um, and sort of revitalize it because all professors know that the like thing that's gonna get them is if they get behind the curve. Yeah. So science is always pushing forward, always looking forward. When you write a grant, you have to have a new bright idea that's different than everyone else. So if you're just stuck in your old ways, you're not going to get funded. Um, so they need new fresh blood all the time in order to um, keep those ideas going and to really move science forward. Right. And I understand that Larry Young's lab has a lot of grants from a lot of different sources from what I was told last week. Yeah, <laughs> we are very, very fortunate. Um, Larry is a master at grant writing um, and just really great at selling his science and securing funds for us. So um, I never have to worry about getting paid or having enough materials for my research. Like, seriously, I, I spend so much money in the lab <laughs> because science is really expensive and in my previous labs like I had to double check with everything and like really make sure I needed it and I just write it down on a sheet of paper on a on a google form and it gets ordered for me no questions asked so um he's got all the grant funding because you know people think that our our science is important and um that there's utility to it so um you know what, just for the what what would cost a lot of money? I'm just curious uh, for those of us who know know nothing about this. What costs a lot of money? Yeah, so um, keeping keeping taking care of the voles is pretty expensive. So um, I think it's like it doesn't sound expensive, but I think it's like seventy cents a day per vole, mm -hmm. and we probably have like I we have like several hundred voles. Oh, a lot of voles. <laughs> oh, and wow. so taking care of them is expensive because we yeah a veterinary staff and a care facility and all that kind of stuff um and then you know equipment is really expensive so like a microscope could be like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for one microscope and you know usually you need different types of microscopes microscopes can get up to over a million dollars um you know i i bought three pipettes that was this was my first big purchase in the lab i bought three pipettes and it cost over a thousand dollars um just for three of them and a full what are pipettes what are pipettes um they're the little like you know when you think of scientists like doing this motion with like oh a yeah and skinny thing for yeah, yeah. moving liquid from one place to another yeah um so those are really i mean every it's kind of stupid there's a whole i think that science uh there's a huge markup in science products you know um but i guess it's 
uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's just so expensive. So everything in science costs money. And then also for the grants, um, they're paying for our salaries. So yes. um, part of the grants is to pay for so people is always expensive. Exactly. So, so she says, uh, Joey says, I imagine bulls are more expensive than mice. And she says, uh, he says, they say, I just, I just use the little plastic ones. What are yours made of? The, <laughs> yeah, you'd think they're made of gold based on how much they cost. Yours probably cost that much too. You just didn't know it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're Eppendorfs if you use pipettes. They're, you know, they're the nice kind, I guess. So. And are bulls more expensive than mice? I believe so. I don't actually know entirely how much they cost a day, but I think they are more expensive just because they're a little bigger and they eat a little bit more food. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, anybody else have any other questions? I'm, I'm looking to make sure I answer anybody. This has been, oh, I have one last question, which is, so what's next? So what do you do? How long are you doing your PhD? And then what happens after that? Yeah, great. That's a great question. Um, so I think I'll, so I'm in my second year right now. Um, and I think I'll probably be here for another like four years, which I know sounds really crazy um, and very, very long, um, but it actually is starting to stress me out at how little time that is because science takes a really long time and there's a lot to get done before those four years are up. Um, so I'm hoping to be out of here um, in about four more years. And then after that, um, I sort of have two routes in mind. Um, I either wanna go and stay in academia um, go do a postdoc and then become a PI, you know, start my own lab. Um, but I have been toying with the idea of going sort of more the industry route. So, you know, consulting or um, working for a pharmaceutical company, um, doing something where I'm not maybe necessarily in the lab every day doing research, but using the skills that I've learned as a scientist um, in a more um, corporate setting. Um, so I'm not entirely sure which route I want to go um, because there's benefits and um problems with both uh but i have four more years fortunately <laughs> so i have time before i have to really figure that out and what when will you know you're done like is that the end when will you know the that's like i'm done with my phd <laughs> yeah i think you sort of um you you have a committee um when you're in grad school of mm -hmm. like five faculty members who are sort of in charge of seeing you through to the end um and you meet with them about every six months um, and it's sort of up to the committee to determine whether you've done enough work to warrant getting to be called doctor. Uh, so they sort of set expectations for you and you set expectations for yourself and you report to them how you're meeting them, if you need to adjust them. Um, and at a certain point in time, I, I would say, you know, they start to ask you like, what's your endpoint? And you kind of set it. Um, it. So there's no like, oh, you've done this much, you're done. It's more like your committee discusses and decides whether they think you're sort of at the level where you can move on um, and graduate. Um, so it's unfortunately not an exact science on when you get to graduate, um, but you do hope, hopefully get to, you know, have a mutual agreement on that one. So. And will you have um, uh, will you have published things by the end of this time? Uh yeah, yeah, that's the goal of a PhD is to get as many publications as possible. So um, I'm hoping to at least get one publication with my um, actual science um, because and, you know, publications take years and years and years to put together. So hopefully I'll get one of those um, and then I'll probably try to do some um, writing in the form of like review papers or book chapters, um, little things like that um, in order to get a few more publications under my belt. That sounds great. Well, I think uh, that's it. I think everyone's leaving out and uh, there is a survey in there, please. Everybody that's left, would you fill out the survey? That'd be awesome. You're gonna get a uh, drawing for a DoorDash gift card if you fill out the survey. And Sarah, I am so thrilled that you could join us. I am excited to invite you to Horizon Theater in Little Five Points when we can open again, which hopefully will be sometime. Definitely. In the next I would love to come. Episode. But it has been a pleasure talking to you. Good luck with all your research and uh, look forward to maybe hearing in the future what you what you come up with. The whole now I'm really interested in Larry Young's slide. Now I know so much about it. Yeah, you got You can follow him on Twitter. He's pretty active on Twitter. I will. To. I I will. I just actually got active on Twitter myself very recently. So. Oh, nice! Exciting. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. This was really wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna just stay up so you can use the uh, serve any that's left, uh, but we're gonna put some music on and thank you so much. Uh, enjoy and uh, have a great week. <laughs>